All right. So today we're going to continue where we left off last last time. So simple uh, P controller. Uh, let's see, uh, MATLAB Simulink actually. Demo, and I'll record this later and post it online, like something similar to what we do in class. Uh, demo. Plus, we'll see how to quantify time response of first order systems. Okay. So let's recall last from last time that I think this is what we did. We stopped here, right? Plus minus x of s. I think k, the gain. And then this was 1 over s minus alpha. And you will see uh, shortly that you can put this in general as alpha over s plus beta, but actually we won't do that. This is enough for illustration purposes. In the sense where we stopped was, I'm going to put the bars over the x and y. I asked you to find the closed loop transfer function, right? I'm going to label this as HC of S, where HC is closed loop transfer function, and it's so called because we're closing the loop. That's all it is. Therefore, how do we find this? We want y over, so hc of s is y of s over x of s. That's what we want, yes? So let's see how to do this. So y of s gets fed back, okay? And like I said, this is the error signal here, x minus y, right? Uh, hence, what we have is k times x of s minus y of s which is the output over here, multiplied by our open loop transfer function, equals what? What does this equal? So what does this equal? According to this picture, so you feed this back, you get x minus y multiplied by k, multiplied by 1 over s minus alpha, what is that equal to? It's just, yeah, it's just y of s. Now, so it's a recursive definition, right? But this will let us compute. So from here, what is uh, x of s? I mean, sorry, what is y of s over x of s? So let's call this h of s, the open loop transfer function. Let's do it in general. Right? So this is kx of s minus ky of s. Um, let's see. Is there an easier way to do this? No. I just have to. y of s is y of s, okay? So, this is kh times x of s equals y of s times 1 plus kh. Yeah? So, in other words, y of s over x of s, in general, for this feedback topology, so that's what this is called, uh, for this feedback topology, okay, if you call this h of s, it's kh over 1 plus kh. That's the closed loop transfer function. Let me close this door. All right. Okay, any questions on this? But now watch, right? It's, again, it's not magic, it's math. Uh, for us, but if h of s is 1 over s minus alpha, this implies your closed loop transfer function is what? k over s minus alpha over 1 plus k over s minus alpha. So, this is what? This implies 
over uh, let's see where each C of S is what? K over S minus what? So, so let's so I put it under a common denominator, right? So you get S minus alpha plus K. So if I factor out a negative sign, what do I get? Alpha minus K. Yeah? Okay? Therefore, notice, uh, recall that for our open loop system, HC, which is 1 over S minus alpha, alpha is positive, okay? Here is the pole zero plot. That's where the pole is, right? What about the closed loop system? So where do you want the pole to be? Left hand side, right? So how do I make the pole? So where is the pole of this alpha minus k? Yes? How do I move the pole to the left hand side? Yeah, k larger than alpha. Perfect, right? So here is alpha minus k. That's it. System becomes stable. Just beautifully because of math, right? However, let me put this in red. Something happened, right? In the sense, so what is the difference? So here is the closed loop transfer function. The entire thing in feedback, okay? As opposed to the open loop transfer function. Is the location of the pole the only thing K affects? What does what else does it affect? Not a zero. Chris is almost right. So what so visually I mean or mathematically K came up in the numerator, right? So in other words, this is the point that uh, note feedback does affect the amplitude of the output response we can see that if you look just simply look at the dc gain all right for both functions uh, for example if you use dc gain so what is for dc what is the value of S you plug in? So DC means uh, huh? zero. zero. H of zero, right? What's the DC gain of this guy? Ne yeah, that's exactly right. So it's negative one over alpha. What's the DC gain of this guy? Yeah, K over alpha minus gain. There, there you go, right? minus k over here all right so in other words if you want to factor k out it's 1 over one minus alpha over k yes the reason why I wrote it like this is what happens if k is much much bigger than alpha what's the DC gain of this guy one, okay? That's maybe, so you basically, uh, in this case, if alpha is positive, right? You get a gay DC gain less than one. Here you get a unity DC gain. Right? So it does affect the amplitude of your response. But this is uh, details that we'll study in uh, 3720, right? But the fact I want you to notice, the main thing is I can actually make my system stable. Look, the, this DC gain does not help you if your system is unstable. Right? You can't really compute, like, your system is unstable, no uh, characterization makes sense because your output is not bounded. First thing is we stabilize the system. Then we 
uh, work on like whatever transient response, steady state error, DC gain that we want. So now what we'll do is I'm gonna pause this lecture and we're gonna switch to MATLAB. Again, I won't, um, I'll record an equivalent of the MATLAB stuff and post it online. But first, let me pause the lecture and get into MATLAB. All right, we're back. So I'll basically put the MATLAB recording later. Actually, in the MATLAB recording, I'll do that interesting example. So what I'll do is let me record. So I'll take a simple pen, a pendulum, right? And I'll hit it with a pulse. So the linearized pendulum is small angle approximation, like, right? It'll do this. Now I'll hit it with a larger pulse, the linear one, which has the, the pendulum has a sign nonlinearity, okay? It'll still do this. But the realistic pendulum, is, so let's say you're talking about a real physical pendulum. If I hit it with a pulse, a large pulse, so let me do this. So I'll do a Simulink example, so I'll write it here. So here is the Simulink example. To see the actual like beauty of nonlinearity. So let's say I have a pendulum, okay? A physical pendulum. I hit it with a large pulse. So this is, I don't know, F of T, force, impulse, really large. Physically, let's say I have a, not this, but let's say I have a point pivot. So let's say it's theta, okay, actually it's, so I hit it with a force like that, really large. What's gonna happen to this? Physically, what's going to happen? Let's say it's, it's a point uh, pivot. Huh? Al almost. It's not because I'm... It's just a pulse, right? So it's not... I'm not going to... I'm not applying the force continuously. So in other words, the pendulum is free to rotate about this axis. That's why it's a point pivot. Okay? Yes, it'll go all the way around. So if you see in Simulink, Theta will go to 6.28. Why 6.28? 2 pi. The linear one will not do that. No matter how much you increase the amplitude, because you lost the sign. Right? So it's a characteristic of nonlinear systems, multiple equilibrium points. And you can see that in simulating. I'll demo it. It's very easy, right? In the sense, you just use the um, the correct blocks. Right? I'll put it online. So anyway. All right, let's get back to our more mundane stuff. That is, we need to look at uh, some parameters. So what we'll do is we'll look at, um, uh, what is it called, this, uh, parameters for characterizing, characterizing first order systems. That is, well, I want to just write systems. I don't want to say transfer function. So we're going to, in other words, have a standard first order transfer function. This is the form which control engineers use. A over S plus A, okay? Why is this first order? Because, so let me put a star here. So you have, it's first order because Y of S over X of S is A over S plus A, correct? So if I write, if I find the inverse Laplace transform of this, what do I get? I get dy dt plus ay equals ax, right? You see why it is first order? It's got, for in the time domain, first derivative, or you have only one pole, that's the equivalent, right? If I had an s squared here, multiple, two poles, okay? There'll be a second derivative. Of course, I'm assuming that there is no pole zero cancellation, that is, it's in the simple, most simplified form, okay? But this is the standard for a first order. Next lecture, we'll see the standard form for a second order. And that's it. There are only standard forms for first order and second order because higher order systems, as you will learn in 3720, third order and beyond, you usually approximate them as second order by using the concept of dominant poles. Okay, but we're not going to talk about it in this class. But let's see. Uh, to quantify the characteristics of the system, it's actually very simple. So we'll try to finish it in the next like five minutes. If not, we'll continue in the next lecture. So to quantify, actually, let's finish this next lecture. Let me just tell you the concepts. Start with the concepts. Characteristics 
of any system, not only first order, we use step response. Okay? Why step? Why not impulse? Almost, Chris is right. Like, so what's impulse? Like, what's the problem with the impulse? What is an impulse? How do you generate an impulse physically? Yeah, so what would you do? Yeah, it's basically infinite amplitude, amplitude for a very short time. It's easier to generate a step. It's even more easier to generate sine functions. Okay, But if you recall your 2070, to get the body plot, right, you have to sweep all frequencies. Yes? The body plot completely characterizes the system, but you need all frequencies. So you do step. Right? That's why people use step. Uh, therefore, our x of s is going to be 1 over s. Okay? So let's find out what the response is. This implies y of s is going to be a over s times s plus a. And this works out nicely because of the way we chose the function as 1 over s minus 1 over s plus a. That's why we actually have this a right, in the numerator. So in other words, if I take the inverse Laplace transform of this, I get my time response as 1 minus e to the minus a t u of t. Of course, we assume a is positive, okay? That the system is stable. Because the system is unstable, none of these quantities, as you will see, settling time, rise time, time constant, settling time and rise time, it will not make any sense, right? Because this function is not bounded, yeah? It's an implicit assumption that your system is stable. Okay. So let's do the time constant because you guys should be, you guys should know that, right? So that's the first thing, time constant. What's the definition of time constant? That is when the t is tau, like y at t equals tau is what? So in other words, how do I pick my tau here? So what happens on the right-hand side? That's my question. So in one time constant, so y at t equals tau is what? What is it going to be? Do you remember from 2017? Huh? Is Almost. Scott's right. That's very good. Is it a? What happens if tau equals a? What do I get here? I get a squared here, right? I don't want a squared. JP is saying something 1 over. So what do I like here? 1. Yes? How do I get 1 here? That's right. That's the time constant. Remember this guy, 1 over a? It's the inverse of the pole location. Okay? Because pole is a measure of frequency. Angular frequency. Reciprocal of frequency is time. So it makes, kind of is like making intuitive sense. Right? So if I pick tau as 1 over a. So let's see this. T is tau. So T is 1 over a. U of T so I get 1 minus e to the minus 1 u of t, which is approximately 0.63, right? Remember this? And this is where we'll stop. Therefore, tau, which is defined as 1 over a, something very important. Your transfer function has to be of the form a over s plus a, okay? Only then is this partial fraction expansion valid. Only then you will get 1 minus e to the negative 1. Is that clear? If your transfer function is of the form 1 over s plus a, you have to rederive this. Okay? Is that very clear? Don't blindly apply this formula. Just understand how we got it. Right? So, when it's 1 over a, this implies, and again, this is where we'll stop, time constant is the time taken for the response to reach 63% approximately of the final value. Remember this from 2070? So the same thing. It's like, I mean, it's the same idea. It's a universal thing in the sense for first order systems, I say universal in the sense this could be a mechanical system, right? doesn't have to be an RC circuit. 
Oh yeah, that's why we'll stop. Since we have only two more minutes, there are two more characteristics for second order systems. And we'll cover this next time. So next time, we'll look at rise time and TS. What do you think TS is? Think. Huh? Steady state. Yes, ex excellent. It's called settling time. Yes. Exactly. For a first order system, it's five time constants. Yeah. Actually, um, control engineers, they use four time constants. Yeah, yeah question? Yes, exam is only gears and DC motors. And you have submitted corrections, right? So we'll talk about it later like your corrections and stuff but yeah exam is just gears and dc motors it's on monday oh we don't have lecture on friday okay forgot about that so i'll see the uh, so this is because of the fire drill all right or whatever the evacuation drill so we don't have next lecture monday is your exam thanks for reminding me it's only gears and dc motors okay no state space so whatever you did on the homework before last homework okay, is fair game i have it graded i just didn't bring it so stop by my office if you want to pick it up well, yes, please take your laptop. So yeah, I'll see you on the exam next week.